Hello, this is Mark Peacock, and welcome to the Travel Commons Podcast. This is Travel Commons Podcast number 196, recorded Friday, September 29th, 2023. It's the podcast giving the voice to the traveler. It's more about the journey than the destination. Two topics on this beer-focused edition of the Travel Commons Podcast, beer tourism and travel, and how to plan a beer trip. So coming to you today from the Travel Commons studios in Nashville, Tennessee, after trips to Portland, Maine, and Asheville, have to pronounce that distinctly, Asheville, North Carolina, we uh, we flew up to Portland International Jetport. I love that, Jetport. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's a throwback to the 50s and 60s when, you know, jet planes weren't assumed, a lot of prop planes. Uh, going down that click hole about Jetport, apparently Orlando International Airport was originally called Orlando Jetport. I don't know. It feels like they shouldn't have changed that. That was a miss. I th- I really think that's a miss. It would have been, uh, I don't know, would have had a very Epcot vibe to it. I really think that Portland Jetport missed a trick by not playing Steve Miller's jet airliner on a continuous loop in baggage claim. But at least they do have a big stuffed moose there, which, you know, I guess it's probably for Maine, probably more on brand. More interesting, though, were the seven foot signs we passed walking up to the TSA lines for our flight back from Portland to Nashville. I posted a picture on Twitter. The sign to the left said, are you packing? Guns of any kind are not permitted in carry-on bags. The one on the right, have you checked your firearms? And then the small one in between reminded people to dump their oversized liquids. I don't know. I I got looking at at that, and I thought, really, we're now 22 years on from the September 11th attacks, and people still can't figure this out, that you can't take a gun on a plane, nor a sword, nor a knife— Longtime listeners will know that I am in no way, shape, or form an apologist for the TSA, but I got to tell you, when I see the pictures that TSA posts on Twitter of some of the stuff people try to bring on, I mean, a hatchet at O'Hare Airport, throwing knives at Milwaukee Airport, I'm not sure how patient I'd be as a TSA agent if I had to deal with that level of obliviousness day in and day out. On the upside, though, I did see that the TSA would allow me to carry on a live lobster if I wanted to take a bit of Maine back home with me. According to the TSA website, a live lobster is allowed through security and must be transported in a clear plastic spill-proof container, which assumes that there's, I don't know, maybe some liquid? Maybe it's just ice. But anyhow, it goes on to say, a TSA officer will visually inspect your lobster at the checkpoint. I wonder if that visual inspection includes checking that the rubber bands around the lobster claws are intact. I mean, I'd think a traveler wielding unholstered lobster claws might, they might not be armed, but they'd certainly be dangerous. So following up, you know, I would have loved to play, I don't know, 15 seconds of Jet Airliner just now for the bridge music into this segment. And I would have if I wasn't pretty much like 99% positive, I'd get slapped with some copyright fine or cease and desist letter. So uh, there you go. Uh, Thelma Smith stopped by the Travel Commons Facebook page to leave a comment about last episode's discussion of renting a Hertz EV uh, for my Portland trip, which I ended up backing away from, as I talked about, as I looked at charging options in the city of Portland and then up in Bar Harbor around Acadia National Park. Thelma wrote, wanted to chime in on EVs. We have a Tesla Model 3. When planning out a trip of any length, we use PlugShare. It helps in finding all sorts of chargers and not just Tesla fast chargers. Might help in seeing what's out there. Thelma, thanks very much for that. It's actually the first I've heard of PlugShare, which just probably shows you how unplugged I am from the EV ecosystem. I went to the website. It looks like a nice crowdsourced status map for chargers. If Hertz had referenced that or pointed it out in any of their materials, uh, I don't know. It might have tipped me toward renting the EV. 
Now, while it didn't show many more Bar Harbor options, it showed a lot more options in Portland. I mean, Hertz continues to send me EV offers, so with this, I don't know, maybe I'll give it a go on my next trip. J.D. Power released their 2023 North American Airport Satisfaction Survey last week. Now, we talked in the last episode that, according to TSA counts, we've gotten back to pre-COVID passenger volumes. And and so it kind of makes sense to then go back and compare J.D. Power's 2023 customer sat numbers to their pre-COVID 2019 scores. And, conveniently enough, in episode 156... In October 2019, we talked to J.D. Power's survey's author, Michael Taylor, after the release of that 2019 survey. Back then, Michael predicted... Everybody's phasing in and out of construction there. They've got all these various plans that are revolving on the inside and the outside of the airport. And so we're going to see this churn in the rankings quite a bit in the next few years as these projects phase in and out. So, well, yes and no. The top of the mega category, the largest airports, was pretty stable. Detroit, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Las Vegas kept their top three positions, but there was a bit of churn under that. San Francisco SFO jumped seven spots from 13th to 6th. And I think that probably proves Michael's point about construction. I think that jump was due to the huge renovations that they've done there, while Orlando dropped five spots from 4th to ninth, and Phoenix dropped six from 7th to 13th. Neither of those drops surprised me, given my most recent experiences at those airports. Now, the benefits of finally finishing big renovations really showed up in the next category, the large airports, LaGuardia and New Orleans, airports that I've spent, honestly, way too much time in, finished their multi-billion dollar renovations between the 2019 and the 2023 surveys, and the results showed. Uh, LaGuardia jumped 13 places from 27th, the bottom of the list on the 2019 survey, to 14th. And could you say, wow, for all the money spent, they should have gotten higher? I don't know. Given all the inherent problems with LaGuardia, its location, its It's just crammed footprint and, quite honestly, the mess that the FAA has made of the tri-state air traffic control situation. I'm not sure LaGuardia could have gotten much better. New Orleans, though, went from a not much better 23rd spot in 2019 to 8th, a 15-place move. Portland, Oregon, the 2019's top large airport, just plummeted, dropped, pick your verb there, 11 spots to the 12th position, while San Diego and Oakland each dropped 10 spots to 23rd and 24th, respectively. Honestly, more interesting than all this to me was the increase in the average scores in what has been a difficult year for air travel. Now, on J.D. Power's 1,000-point scale, the mega average, the mega airport average, increased 16 points from 756 to 772 while the large airport average grew 24 points from 765 to 789. So if an airport didn't improve its score, if they just stayed put, which is pretty much what happened to Orlando and Oakland, their rankings just tumbled. Now, in the last episode, I talked about the rolling delays for the implementation of ETS, E-T-I-A-S, which is the EU's upcoming version of the U.S.'s ESTA, which is, you know, all those acronyms. It's pretty much just a pre-travel authorization system for people who aren't required to have visas. Now, the EU system was originally supposed to go live in 2021, and that got pushed to this spring, May 2023, which, I don't know, you know, given COVID, that, that makes a lot of sense. Then it got slipped six months to what was supposed to be November 2023, so just a couple months from now. Well, you know, okay, so, you know, maybe a little more testing is for the best. But then it became a more nebulous sometime in 2024. Now, for anybody who's done large projects, that's never a good sign. And now here we are just a month later, and they're saying it's now going live May 2025. It kind of feels like this is becoming the EU's real ID. I mean, really, because quite honestly, the the new U.S. real ID deadline is also May 2025 until they change that one again. 
And hey, if you've got any travel stories, questions, comments, tips, rants, the voice of the traveler, send them along to comments, C-O-M-M-E-N-T-S at travelcommons.com. You can always send a message on Twitter, X, I don't know, whatever we're calling it nowadays, to M. Peacock. Post your thoughts on the Travel Commons page like Thelma did, or hit the Instagram account at Travel Commons. Or, you know, quite honestly, you could just skip all that social media stuff, go old school, post your comments on the website at travelcommons.com. So the first topic on today's Travel Commons podcast is beer tourism and travel. Scrolling through the episode section of the Travel Commons website, I saw that it's been over a year since I've done any beer content. And so immediately began working on rectifying that just critical oversight. I asked John Hall, longtime beer journalist, editor of All About Beer and host of the Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast to give us his thoughts about beer tourism. John, thanks for coming on the podcast. We want to talk about beer tourism and travel. I'm an old guy. For the longest time, the idea of beer tourism kind of seemed to start and end with renting Lederhosen and heading to Munich for Oktoberfest. And then in the early mid-aughts, then we got specialty beer releases that morphed into festivals like Three Floyd's Dark Lord Days. I, yeah, I mean, I was living in Chicago at the time. And you know that went from like a couple hundred people queuing for a bottle release to 2019 was like 13,000, 15,000 people that people. People yeah. traveling around the country to see it. Gave and, people a lot of excuses to cross that Indiana border. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've been to Munster, Indiana, and there's not a lot of other reason to go there other than three oh. Floyds. And, and then they shut the brew pub down uh, during COVID. And now there's absolutely no reason to go there. And then now every town, region, state, I don't know, seems to have some sort of a beer trail. Last month in August, I was in Portland, Maine, and it was the Maine Beer Trail. And then yep. I was in Asheville, North Carolina, at Asheville Ale Trail, as well as the Brewing District. It just seems to be a, an area that's really grown. So what are your thoughts on that? How significant is beer tourism for local economies now? I think it depends on the location. Where there is a concentration of breweries, it makes sense to have a beer trail. It makes sense for a guild or an organization to get together to try to convince not only the tourists, but the locals to come out as well. And so with, you know, there's 10,000 breweries thereabouts, a little less in the U.S. these days, and a lot of them are concentrated together. Their strength in numbers. And Hopefully, they're all doing something that is diverse enough that can get folks to go from one place to the next to the next without getting hazy IPA fatigue. And I, I think Portland, Maine is a great example of the breweries that are there. You have some of the old stalwarts, Geary's and Allagash and some of the others, some of the older, newer ones like Bissell Brothers. And then, you know, there, there's some really cool ones that exist now like Bellflower that are there. So you get breweries of different sizes, of different scopes. And I think it's important for the bottom line of these places, so long as they're delivering good quality beer. But what's cool for me is being a tourist in a in a new city I get to go to different areas. I get to go see a place that is not just the picturesque downtown. It's not just what's on the postcards for sale at the local travel kiosk. So you get to go into neighborhoods where people live and work. And for me, that's always a better sense of of, of, of getting to know a city, of getting to know people, of getting to know a place, um, you know, because neighborhoods can change, especially something like Chicago. Uh, from block to block, you're walking into neighborhoods that have different vibes, that have different histories to them, uh, and that feel different. And so when I'm traveling for beer, um, it's fun for me to not only go and settle up at a tap room and 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 spend some time there, but also to walk the neighborhoods as well. And I think that location informs a lot of what beer makers do. I'll keep going back to Dovetail. I've spent more time there than than I'll actually admit. 
and it's right up against the brown line. And they use that to their advantage. You know, they talk about their cool ship. They talk about how their windows open up to the brown line and that the beer is inoculated with whatever, you know, the, the transit line brings them. And I think that that's a, that's a fun thing. You get a, you're not necessarily tasting a sense of place, mm-hmm. uh, but you get the idea that it might be there. Right. God only knows I've ridden the brown line enough times. So maybe I've helped dovetail uh, inoculate some of their cool ship beers. And go to the Pacific Northwest at this time of year in mid-September, uh, late October, when uh, in Yakima and in parts of Oregon, uh, they are harvesting the hops right now. You can bounce from brewery to brewery and the the air is aromatic with fresh hops. The brewers are making fresh and wet hop beers. People are coming in from around the country, from around the world. Uh, and there's an, an excitement and an energy that exists uh, because of the agricultural product that is going into these beers and because of the harvest window as well. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be a festival. It doesn't always have to be a, I'm going some point. It can be for a harvest season. And I think that that's a, another cool way that folks who aren't even in the beer industry can experience a different aspect of their pints. What's the best way to find out what's going on in a location? How do you think about where are you going to go? I I like not having firm plans when I'm traveling. Because the other thing about beer tourism, right, we're talking about beer trails, is you start at one place and you say, okay, we got five places on our list today. <laughs> um, you know, so we're saying you're just having a pint at each, right? It's still five pints at the end of the day. And even for a, a serious drinker like me, um, that's a lot. But if you're having a good time, I think it's great to not have structure because if you say, okay, we're at stop number two and you know, we have three more stops in, in front of us, but we're really liking this. And they have this other beer that I want to try and we're comfortable and we're in good seats and the food truck is awesome and all that. Like, cool, just stay there. Like, you know, like live in that moment. I, I, I feel, I, I've seen too many people get caught up in this sort of ticking culture or uh, we have to, you know, hit all of these spots for whatever sort of weird list and everything. And you're missing out on the fun experiences. Beer is about camaraderie. It's about being in the place. It's about, you know, experiencing flavor. Uh, and if you're rushing through it, you know, it's not that much fun. I, th- I think beer in the way that it's grown over the last couple of decades, right? It's not doing you know super well volume wise or sales wise. Mm-hmm. The, the craft beer space comparatively, it's like 12, 13% of the overall marketplace. But I think it has helped people appreciate flavors better mm-hmm. uh, and to be a little bit more curious and to be a little bit more um, experimental. I think there's also a learning component too. And I think you brought it up, which is you're, you're going to push yourself outside your normal boundaries, outside of what I've called a travel bubble. That's the cool thing about travel, right? You, you talk to folks all the time about you know when they go to a new place and they want to have the local drink or they want to have the local food because they want to immerse themselves in that culture. You can do that with beer no matter where you go. So much of what brewers are doing these days too, when you travel, if you only drink American light lagers or you only drink Irish stouts or you only drink something you know particular, if you're traveling, you might try the Goza. You might try a Lambic. You might try a barley wine or something like that because you're feeling a little bit more loose and unencumbered to, to the constraints of your, of your daily day. And that for me is sort of the fun thing about beer. And usually it'll taste better from that place, you know, because you're surrounded by the people who made it and the people who also are excited to be there. It's, you know, it's folks who go on vacation to a tropical island and they're drinking Mai Tais and it's the best Mai Tai I've ever had. And they learn how to make the Mai Tai and they come home and they do it on their back patio and they're like, this doesn't taste as good. And it's because you've lost that sense of place. And so for me, I, I'm, I'm always just trying to experience not just what's in my glass, but what's around me as well. John, I appreciate you coming on talking to us about beer tourism and beer travel. It's something we've talked a lot about on this podcast, only just because I really like beer. And sure. <laughs> But it's been great talking to you. Thanks very much, John Hall, editor for All About Beer. Both your podcast and your website. Check it out. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you. And as always, check out the show notes on the Travel Commons website to find links to read and listen to John. The second topic on today's Travel Commons podcast is how to plan a beer trip. 
Now, if John Hall has got you starting to think about beer tourism, the next logical question, how do you plan for it? Here's John's approach. I plan out travel, especially for specific events like Hop Harvest or Oktoberfest, which I'm going to for the first time this year. I plan that out at least a year in advance because I want to make sure that one, I can get hotels and transportation and budget out and all of that. Social media is terrible in a lot of ways, but it can also be helpful in certain ways of getting you excited about traveling to new places. And when I hear about annual beer festivals in Belgium or see folks who are out at hop harvest picking hops, it gets me in a certain sort of way if I'm sitting at my desk at home saying, gosh, I wish I was there. So then I put stuff on the calendar and start to say, okay, well, think about this and then go from there. When I'm traveling to a city for work, you know, I'm usually going to visit specific breweries or, or specific people. But nine times out of 10, I will also call friends of mine and say, where are you drinking these days? Or what's exciting you these days? And there, there's always going to be the one place that the serious beer nerd should go to. But then you peel that onion back just a little bit and all of a sudden it's, you know, well, you know, I, I actually had a really fun experience at such and such place or I had this one beer or they're doing some cool stuff and it starts to say, all right, well, I trust them. So what do I have to lose? It's either going to be a great pint or it's not. So there you go. Advanced planning for the big stuff and have beer nerd friends in every city who can point you to the out of the way nuggets. The latter is probably a bit easier for John, a well-known beer journalist, than it is for the rest of us, though. Now, back in episode 174, I talked about the same thing with Rob Cheshire, a longtime Travel Commons listener and for the last three plus years, a UK craft beer podcaster with his This Week in Craft Beer podcast. How do you plan your taproom visits? It's all driven through Google for me, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I might have some idea based on previous reading or whatever about some big name places that I want to visit in a particular city. But beyond that, I'm just going to Google first of all. I'll plot a Google map for the city. And I'll end up with 50, 60, maybe even 100 pins on the map. Pretty quickly, I'll go to Untapped and look at the average brewery rating. And this really makes brewers cross how much I rely on untapped for, for this type of thing. Because <laughs> I had this conversation a load of times on the podcast with them. But I do rely on brewery ratings on untapped. And I find they're very reliable, quite frankly. If a brewery's got an average rating of anything close to four, then I mean, obviously it's a massive generalization to say whatever they brew, but most of their beers are going to be great. If the brewery rating is anywhere close to 3.5, it's going to be very mediocre at best. Mm -hmm. you know. And somewhere in between is where most people land. So 3.6, it's mm, 3.8. Yeah, it's a good brewery. 3.9, it's a terrific brewery. Four is a great brewery. And so I'm looking for those 3.8s and 3.9 average brewery ratings. What I'm looking for really is, is that district where I can walk from one to another and really make an afternoon of it. So me, I kind of mash the two up. Like Rob, I'm also a pretty solid untapped user. Rob often says it's his beer diary, and that's pretty much what it is for me, too. I mean, when people ask me for recommendations for a city, Budapest was the most recent ask, I can quickly pop open the app and give people at least a starter of a list. And when I'm in a new city trying to find a good place for beer, if I'm by myself, I'll open it up and look at the nearby activity tab to see where and what folks are drinking. Now, back to episode 194's discussion of flaneuring, or roaming entropy, as I like to call it. Some of my best wanders had, as their eventual end point, a bar or a tap room that I had found that way. But as John says... If you let your friends know you're deep into beer, they'll be looking out for you. Visiting Savannah, Georgia back in May, our friends couldn't wait to take me downtown to Two Tides Brewing, a microbrewery in a hundred-year-old house with great beers, but no door onto the balcony because of a door tax way back when in Savannah, apparently where houses, according to the story they told me, were taxed on the number of doors they had. So we ducked down and walked through a big window with our glasses multiple times, great beer and a history lesson. Not sure I would have found that without much help. Coming up in a couple of weeks, we're heading back to New York City, and our daughter already has an ambitious list for us to tackle. Also, Rob Cheshire and I have traded beer touring tips for our hometowns. Rob took me to his favorite places in the railway arches of London's Bermondsley Beer Mile. But when Rob hit Chicago three weeks after we'd moved to Nashville, 
I couldn't reciprocate the personal tour, and so instead emailed him the couple of taproom circuits I would have taken him on if he'd showed up, I don't know, say a month earlier. And actually for all of you, my friends and listeners, I'll put those Chicago taproom circuits in this episode's show notes on travelcommons.com. And if you'd like other ideas, not only just Chicago, but other places, you can check out my list of, yeah, I'd go back there, taprooms, in the episode 187 show notes. Maybe these can help you start your beer tourism planning. Now, the two tent poles for our Asheville trip were hiking and beer tourism. But we were the Asheville pioneers among our friend group, so I didn't have anyone to build taproom circuits for me. So I started down Rob's path, firing up Google Maps and untapped. But then, wait a minute, let's see what AI can do. So I fired up ChatGPT instead and typed in the prompt, develop a taproom circuit of microbrewery taprooms in Asheville, North Carolina, starting at the Aloft Hotel in Asheville, that's where we were staying, and optimized to minimize walking distance and maximize untapped ratings. Present it in a table with the brewery name in the first column, the distance from the previous tap room in the second column, the untapped rating in the third column, and the type of beers served in the fourth column. End prompt. ChatGPT thought for, I don't know, maybe a second, and then started kicking out stuff. The response started with a caveat that it can't access real-time data, and so the untapped ratings and distances are based on its last update at the end of 2022. And so after that throat clearing, ChatGPT spit out a table with eight tap rooms. Eyeballing the list, the names didn't seem too out of whack, so then I checked the untapped ratings. None of them were right, and indeed those were so far out of whack, all on the high side, that eight months of additional check-ins could not have moved those ratings that much. So chalk that up to GPT hallucination, or maybe just trying to be a people pleaser and not wanting to say, I don't know. So then I took the circuit and plugged it into Google Maps, and it wasn't a circuit, that is. It was a bit more of a random walk, doubling back a couple of times, and then rather than working us back to the A-loft in a circle, which a circuit would imply, it ended actually with the farthest away brewery. So anyhow, with no friend recommendations and honestly not a huge amount of trustworthy help from ChatGPT, I fell back to my own ways, flaneuring. I figured with the beer density in Asheville, a random walk was more likely than not to land me in front of a beer tap and a good beer tap, which pretty much proved to be the case. We did what longtime listener Aaron Woodland called in the last episode a walk and gawk, or in this case, maybe a walk and gulp. Okay, that's it. That's the end of Travel Commons Podcast 196. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you decide to stay subscribed. As always, you can find us and listen to the current episodes on all the main podcast sites, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music. As I mentioned last time, no longer Stitcher. I guess SiriusXM pulled a plug on it, though I think you can still find Travel Commons on the other Sirius platforms, Pandora, maybe the Sirius app. But I do know that you can ask your smart speakers, Alexa, Siri, or Google, to play Travel Commons Podcast. Now, you can click on the link in this episode's description in your podcast app to get to the show notes page at travelcommons.com for a transcript of the episode and links to the places that I've mentioned, and also links to John's and Rob's websites. If you're not yet subscribed, there's a drop-down subscribe menu at the top of the Travel Commons homepage. And then at the bottom of the page, you'll find links to all the Travel Commons socials. Hey, if you've got a story, thought, comment, gripe, the voice of the traveler, send them along, text or audio file if you feel like deeply sharing, to comment, C-O-M-M-E-N-T-S at TravelCommons.com, M. Peacock on Twitter, the Travel Commons Facebook page or Instagram site, or as always, you can post your comments on the website at TravelCommons.com. And thanks to everyone who's taken time to send in emails, tweets, post comments on the website site, the Facebook site, the Instagram site. I really do appreciate it. And hey, until we talk again, safe travels, raise a cold or a cast temperature one for me. And thanks for stopping by the Travel Commons. Bye now. Mm -hmm.